Right, it's um, 12.34. Um, welcome to TLOP's educational event, uh, Launch and Learn. Um, today it's myself, Dean Halfpenny, and my colleague, Tom Quick, will be talking about neuropathic pain. I'm going to kick off with uh, more about the mechanisms behind it, the symptoms, and just typically how we would assess a patient with neuropathic pain. Um, I've got a number of slides, obviously, we're gonna start now. Neuropathic pain is quite unlike any other pain, and I am going to go on to pain classification in a moment. It's, it is very, very challenging to manage. I, I'll, I'll start with that, simply, simply because very often there is a problem within the wiring or problems within the nervous system itself, which can be quite difficult to address. But the second half of the talk will be Tom talking about the, the physical things that we can address through surgery. So there is always some hope, but I hope to educate you on exactly what neuropathic pain feels like and, and the medical management that we currently use for it. This is a great picture because really, you know, it's, it's a sharp, it's unpleasant, it's, it's unpredictable. And so, you know, it, it's not something you'd wish on your worst enemy, to be honest. Um, just a quick update on, on, on different pain pathways and, and, and what they mean. Now, I want to talk about nociceptive inflammatory neuropathic and nociplastic pain. And essentially nociceptive pain is physiological detection of a painful stimulus. So normal C fibers, normal poly polymodal nociceptor receptors. So this is a physiological function that is essential for us to stay alive really, because we need to be able to respond to pain when, when, when it comes about. Inflammatory pain is obviously enhanced nociceptive pain, which happens in the presence of an inflammatory event. So, so that can be post-surgery, that can be a chronic inflammatory condition, it can be an inflammatory joint disease. So, you know, inflammatory pain really exacerbates or enhances physiological pain. And again, a little easier to manage with anti-inflammatories, to be honest. Then we come on to neuropathic pain and we will go into it in more detail. Neuropathic pain really is a pain that is initiated or caused by a primary lesion or dysfunction within the nervous system. So this is not a problem with your peripheral nociceptor or your nociceptors, whichever they are. This is a problem with anywhere from nociceptor ending right the way to somatosensory cortex. And you can have a lesion at any point along that pathway that can lead to neuropathic pain. And it is a problem because it results in a lot of neural instability. And this instability causes an awful lot of pain related issues. And finally, we are going to touch briefly on what nociplastic pain is. Now, nociplastic pain is, is the new classification for what we used to call central sensitization. Effectively, it is the same, but it has been renamed uh, within the last few years. And that, of course, is, is pain that is caused by, again, changes within the central nervous system, not entirely the same as neuropathic pain, but nonetheless changes within the central nervous system that make pain or emphasize or enhance pain due to dysregulation centrally. So I want to just bring this slide up just as an example of, of how often the pain may well be mixed. So if we look at the diagram on the left and we're looking at inflammatory or nociceptive type pain, it's fairly straightforward. Arthritis is inflammatory, visceral can be inflammatory, headache, we don't really know exact mechanisms behind it. Ischemic pain, cancer pain and back pain would easily fit into the category of primary nociceptive pain. Now, if we go across to the Venn diagram on the right and we look at what primary neuropathic, now, the best, best examples of pure and primary neuropathic pain are definitely things like PHN, post-hepatic neuralgia, trigeminal neuralgia, HIV, CRPS2, and of course, post-stroke MS and spinal cord injury. So here we've got pure lesions of the nerves. So there's nothing happening peripherally. There may not necessarily be trauma. There can be infection, there can be poisoning, there can be um, um, you know, a, a dysfunction somewhere. And of course, things like post-stroke central pain syndrome, again, is something which is, can be quite devastating. It's a lesion within the somatosensory cortex, or in fact, it can be a lesion anywhere from the thalamus all the way along. Um, and that can induce a, a chronic neuropathic pain state which again is incredibly difficult to manage. But 
I think what is important when assessing any patient for pain is that you keep an open mind and, 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 and assess to, as to whether there is an inflammatory component, an MSK component, whether this is purely neuropathic. And so it is important to be able to classify our pains depending on their origins. So what is the etiology? Um, what I've got here is, is, is again, another way of, of, of sort of going through. How can we obviously direct trauma to nerve, and I'm sure Tom is going to expand on um, avulsion injuries and other traumas to nerves. Um, and of course, things like surgery or incisional trauma can cause neuropathic pain. Typical examples of infection uh, would include HIV and post-hepatic neuralgia, which I'm sure you've probably treated patients who've got uh, shingles and you'll appreciate that it is incredibly painful and can, can be very, very difficult to manage. There are other causes such as small fiber neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy, various vitamin deficiencies, which can lead to uh, dysfunction within the neural system. And they too will create symptoms of neuropathic pain. Then of course, there's, there's vascular, which I've got here is central post-stroke pain. And then under compression, we've got radiculopathies and of course, tumor infiltration, which is the same really as a nerve type trauma. So across the board, there are multiple different etiologies of, of, of neuropathic pain. And I think, again, it's important to take a really good history or, or, or do an absolutely thorough medical assessment of your patient to, to ensure that, you know, one or the other are not causing the neuropathic pain symptoms that they present with. But what's going on with neuropathic pain? Um, I liken it to an electrical short circuit. Imagine that you've got a wire that the insulating sheath becomes stripped off. Good example is, let's say, uh, a, a monoradiculopathy, uh, secondary to a disc trauma. What happens is the inflammatory event or the compressive event from the disc will cause problems with the nerve sheath. And what then happens is you develop instability within that nerve. Now, in order to fire properly, I mean, we, we, we are a bundle of electricity. I mean, we've got tiny little micro end plate potentials buzzing up and down and, 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 and all sorts of action potentials, which, which, you know, not only, you know, outside in, but for our motor system as well. So as soon as you get a breakdown in that, you're going to get some form of, of ectopic activity. And it's this ectopic and spontaneous discharge. In other words, we're not asking for it and we're not doing anything, it, but you end up with a huge amount more pain signals along a pathway, secondary to this membrane instability. Another mechanism is epaptic conduction, where one nerve will actually switch over and code for another nerve. So it does become very complicated when you have a, a significant post uh, neuropathic pain state, in as much as the nerves become somewhat confused and they might actually carry a pain signal, even though they're not a pain nerve as such. Um, we also tend to find that there's collateral sprouting at the primary afferent. So, so the, in fact, the, the, the range that the body, what happens is when you've got neuropathic pain segment, the adjacent areas will start looking for normal pain signals. And so you will get sprouting at primary afferents looking for what is the brain perceives to be as normal because this neuropathic pain is, is, is frankly quite un abnormal and, and our brains are not really used to it. And similar things happen at the dorsal ganglion as well. This is a great slide, um, which I acquired many, many years ago when gabapentin and, 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 and uh, pregabalin came into being. And this, this absolutely demonstrates what is going on. In a hyperexcitable state, you get significant more release of uh, excitable neurotransmission. And so, it makes sense from a mechanistic perspective, if at all possible, to be able to block or slow down or regulate this hyper excitability. And I'll come on to some of the drugs and the drug mechanisms lately, but certainly over excitability at a neuronal level, we're not talking centrally, we're talking within the primary neuron is an important uh, feature of neuropathic pain. I want to briefly touch on what's going on centrally. Now we've talked about peripheral instability, excessive neurotransmitter release. But in addition to that, what typically does happen is that the brain becomes somewhat wound up and more vigilant. So we acquire what we call cerebral vigilance, where the brain is actually, again, scanning for normal input. It's exaggerating the neuropathic pain input. And 
it, it often gets things wrong. In other words, the adjacent areas start to become painful too, when there is actually no real cause for pain anywhere apart from a lesion within the nervous system. So we get wide dynamic range into neurons, which start looking for normal, normal um, uh, afferent pathways. We get a huge amount of wind up, glutamate gets released, and NMD receptors also uh, become quite important in, in this wound up state. The other thing that happens is that the inhibitory pathways, now we must remember that pain not only ascends from the periphery centrally up to the brain, we also have downward control or descending control of pain, which, which is very much dependent on noradrenergic and serotonergic pathways centrally. So we can regulate how much goes up by blocking the amount that arrives in the brain itself. So it's very complicated, but there is a descending pathway. And unfortunately, when we have a, a, a chronic pain state or a neuropathic pain state, these inhibitory pathways tend to be less effective. In fact, that's why we look at ways of treating these um, um, by using various medications. And again, I will come on to that in a moment. So what does it feel like to have neuropathic pain? Well, it's, it's, it's really unpleasant. I had a patient come in yesterday and said, it's numb but painful. I can't feel anything, but it hurts. So, so, so there is this, this, this paradox where you, 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 your supply to an area may be blocked, but it nonetheless is perceived as being incredibly painful. But the words that people often use are shooting or spontaneous pain, burning, electric shock-like, numbness with pins and needles. And, and those are symptoms which unfortunately tend to occur at rest. Um, they can be exacerbated with certain movements, but they are typically 24 seven. They really don't go away. They can be exacerbated, but they are there constantly. Another feature of neuropathic pain is, is hyperalgesia. And that's an exaggerated response to a painful stimulus. So I've got a graph to show that in a moment, but essentially let's assume you, you have a pain stimulus of X in the state, in a neuropathic pain state, it's X tight to the power of two. So it's, it's significantly exaggerated. And another feature of neuropathic pain is something that we refer to as allodynia. A patient's symptom would be called dysesthesia, where they're describing non-painful stimuli as stimulus. Allodynia is the, uh, the sign that you as the clinician would uh, uh, check to see that the patient has got pain in a normal non-painful area. In other words, they report it as pain, but it's not a painful stimulus. So you can see things are clearly wrong. This graph here just highlights what I've said. We've got three curves, the initial curve, Sorry, the one on the far right, the red curve is normal. So you can see at a certain stimulus, your pain threshold will be uh, um, uh, reached after certain stimulus intensity. And it, it has a fairly shallow curve and it's fairly predictable. Now, on the shift to the left, the one in the middle depicts hyperalgesia. In other words, a painful stimulus is, 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 is perceived as being significantly more pain uh, despite the stimulus not being exaggerated. So the initial shift to the left is, is for hyperalgesia. And then the curve on the left, the yellow curve, is, is a curve representing what we call allodynia. So a very low stimulus exceeds the pain threshold fairly quickly um, and, and obviously gradually reaches pain tolerance as your stimulus increases. So the two are superimposed, they do occur together, so that this is just an example for you to, to see the difference between hyperalgesia and allodynia. How do we diagnose it? I think mostly it's based on, as I said earlier, a good medical history, good examination, um, particularly neurological, and of course there, there, there are ways to actually map out uh, neuropathic pain segments, for example, if you have PHN, you can look and see which cutaneous dermatomal segment it affects, um, and you can then map it out accordingly. I have here appropriate laboratory tests and investigations. Now, they're not that brilliant, they're not that reliable, but things like nerve conduction studies can be helpful at diagnosing, particularly things like small fiber neuropathy, particularly things like diabetic neuropathy. So, you know, in the absence of there being a clear cause, so, for example, somebody who presents with uh, post-hepatic neuralgia or shingles, it's probably not that useful to, 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 to send them off for nerve conduction studies when your diagnosis is there. I think where, you, where the diagnosis is less clear from your initial 
neurological examination and laboratory test, then you might decide to go on to do nerve conduction studies just to confirm whether there is neural involvement and what sort of nerve fibers they might include. I've included the land scale. This is something which is rarely used. It's used more in research purposes. It is a validated tool which is very specific asking patients about the type of pain that they have. So, so there are ways of, of diagnosing neuropathic pain. Um, I think what's also important is, is to take a, a standard full pain history, how intense, how uh, invasive is the pain and, and the other effects it might be having, particularly on sleep, anxiety, movement, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it, it, it is important not solely um, look at the, 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 the neuropathic element, but you need to really take a full history and, and work out how it's affecting your particular patient. Again, this slide could be um, uh, taken uh, across the board for any chronic pain state. You're gonna see these things arising, difficult sleeping, lack of energy, drowsiness, concentration, depression, anxiety, poor appetite, et cetera, et cetera. This happens in pretty much all patients with moderate to severe pain. I've always had this slide, there's obviously pain, reduced activity, days of work, low self-esteem, financial difficulties, depressed, unemployed, et cetera. These things do happen. And I think it's really important to, when you are assessing, particularly uh, as, as therapists, you know, if, if you're seeing the appearance of people taking more time off work or uh, doing less physically and becoming depressed, these are early warning signs that things seriously do need to be addressed before they become irreversible. Now, again, why treat early? Uh, it's fairly obvious, isn't it? it? It really, we do need to address the secondary consequences of immobility. It's incredibly important to try and maintain patients, uh, you know, manage their pain to the point that they can continue either in their work or with their exercise. But I think more importantly for me is, is when you have a neuropathic pain state, what happens is you do have a central nervous system hypervigilance. You do have a lot of scrambled signals and, and movement and, and physiotherapy or desensitization can in fact help boost the central nervous system in, in, in being a little more, should we say, correct in what it does. And so prescribing analgesia can be quite important at, at getting them going because very often they, they, they are fearful, things hurt too much. Uh, and so they, they may choose to, to exercise less or do less as a result of it. And that is normal. But if we can bring the pain levels down and encourage them to move, I think that certainly does help a lot. Um, so again, an overview, obviously biomedical, and we've got psychosocial, which we'll come back to in a moment. I want to just, well, because Tom's going to be talking about surgery, and I'd like to simply just talk about some of the analgesics or the medication that we use. Now, simple analgesics such as uh, anti-inflammatories and paracetamol have very, very little role to play in pure neuropathic pain states. They are helpful where it is mixed. So for example, back pain with radiculopathy, where you've got two components, possibly inflammatory, definitely neuropath neuropathic. So you know, I'm not saying that you should never use simple analgesics. I'm just saying in a purely neuropathic pain state such as uh, PHN, it's, they're not going to be of much benefit at all. And so we tend to then look at the classes of drugs which have membrane stabilizing effects or enhance the descending control of pain. And so I'm going to put those into various categories and go through them of antidepressants, anticonvulsants, Opioids, to some extent, they're not brilliant. We'll talk a bit about combined therapy and a little bit about novel therapies. I want to start with the anticonvulsants because I think they probably are the mainstay alongside some of the tricyclics and one or two of the SNRIs. Carbamazepine's been around for a while, gabapentin, pregabalin. What they do is they, they, they stabilize membranes. And by stabilizing membranes, that means less hyperexcitability, less neurotransmitter release, less perception of pain. The problem with all anticonvulsants is that stabilizing membranes is great, but the drugs don't know that your brain that needs to function uh, and that, you know, other, other important uh, regulatory the, the, the sort of neural factors need, need to work. So they can be sedating. They can be difficult to, 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 to live with. So they're not the easiest of medications for patients to take. However, in low dose, I've found them to be reasonably well tolerated. 
and I tend to combine with other agents. I tend to use fairly low doses, but strictly speaking, all of these drugs will to some extent stabilize membrane hyperexcitability and reduce the perception of pain. We're coming on to the tricyclic, the SSRIs and SNRIs. Now again, they have weak benefits. They do enhance the descending control of pain. So they alter serotonergic and noradrenergic uh, concentrations within the brain. And so they regulate the upward transmission of pain and ultimately the perception of pain. Like I said, all of these drugs have a weak effect. There's not one single drug out there that stands head and shoulders above. And it's definitely about selecting the right agent, depending on the patient's pre-mobility, their pain state, whether they've got inflammatory pain. So it is important to be able to select the drug that you feel will work for that particular patient. And there is no one size fits all, unfortunately. Just to let you know that duloxetine is, uh, by NICE guidelines, is the first choice for uh, diabetic neuropathy. Um, but again, it, it, it has weak anti-neuropathic activity. It certainly is, is not something I would say is phenomenally good. I wanna talk quickly about other therapies because this is where we can combine some of the medication with things like lidoderm patches, which are the Versatis patches. Now, Versatis patches are 5% lidocaine, which can be applied to a neuropathic segment. And in some patients, again, it can dial down the symptoms. Uh, the lidocaine is, 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 is absorbed cutaneously and it can reach the nerves and can reduce, again, the membrane instability in that area. But of course, if it is slightly higher upstream, it's unlikely to have an effect. Capsaicin is another drug which I'd say 20, 15, 20 years ago, there was an awful lot of excitement about this because it was said to deplete substance P at the dorsal root ganglion and therefore reduce neuropathic pain. There is some evidence that there's benefit. Again, the studies were very good when they first did them and very hopeful, but capsaicin is a very difficult drug to use. And, and for those of you who've not come across it before, it is in fact chili pepper extract. It's incredibly concentrated. And in fact, when you're using it in terms of patch form, you have to literally mask up put goggles on, double glove, because if you touch it, it can cause a terrific burn. But the principle is that you place it over the area of neuropathic pain, something happens along that primary axon, it depletes substance P, and guess what? Pain is perceived as less. Again, something which is fairly niche, fairly specialized, but not that easy to use. There is capsaicin cream, which patients can take home with them and has some benefit, but again, it needs meticulous hand washing or gloves and needs to be applied six to eight times per day, which is very difficult for patient compliance. It's just simply a very difficult to manage. I brought in here cannabis-based medical products. Um, in my research, and, and certainly speaking to an awful lot of clinicians over in the US and in Canada, there is a, those patients who, who, who perceive cannabis, particularly THC, a lot of them will choose it as their primary anti-neuropathic uh, pain management compared to other agents. These are patients who perhaps have been on long-standing gabapentin, pregabalin, and are looking for something else. And some of the early research or some of the early observational studies suggest that THC in fairly high concentrations is useful. Now, one, one can argue it's, it will it does work on the endocannabinoid system, which again is not necessarily the neuropathic system, um, but nonetheless, if it alters pain perception and the net result is that you perceive your pain to be less and you do more, then it has clinical benefit. Um, but again, it's fairly niche. I certainly would not recommend that you know patients are initially titrated or started on THC con containing compounds. I think that 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 really does come further down the line as per nice guidelines as per British Pain Society guidelines in terms of cannabis-based medical products. I've got TENS here and I've got infusion therapy. Now infusion therapy is quite interesting because I mentioned an MDA receptor antagonism and of course using something like ketamine and lidocaine. Lidocaine is a membrane stabilizer. Ketamine is an NMDA receptor agonist, antagonist. What we get then is we can dissociate pain and occasionally we can alter the cerebral hypervigilance using infusion therapy. Again, it's not for everyone. It is selected for patients where we are seeing a lack of response with, with conventional meds. Uh, and so, but it does have a role to play. I've also included spinal cord stimulation in there, which of course is, I, I don't carry out spinal cord stimulation, but there are a number of, 
of, of, of, of lower limb and upper limb pain states, which are well addressed using spinal cord stimulation itself. So again, a range of options. So just in summary, we've got biomedical, which we've talked about, and Tom's going to talk about surgery in a moment. And of course, the psychosocial, which we should never, we should never underestimate uh, the benefit of, of patients having a better knowledge of their condition, uh, helping to reassure them, uh, helping them with fear avoidance, uh, dealing with anxiety and depression. So, you know, where, where, where necessary, we might call on a psychologist to get involved to address some of these issues. As I said, some neuropathic pain states are for life. And I think when you recognize that, you know, PHN might get better, but diabetic neuropathy or small fiber neuropathy, which is very debilitating, will, will lead to significant uh, problems in later life. So we're not gonna do questions now. I'm gonna hand over to Tom uh, and we'll take questions at the end, but thank you very much. Thanks, Dean. Um... I'm yeah, going to take over there, do this and that. Um, so thanks uh, to Dean for uh, a great overview um, of medical and uh, drug therapies. Um, like any MDT, um, we appreciate that there are aspects uh, where surgery can help. Uh, and it, it has been rather controversial. So the concept of surgery to improve neuropathic pain or as some of my colleagues put uh, pain cutting it out um, is often a little controversial. So let me give you my view uh, on where we are. Um, why me? Well, my background, I, I work as a uh, uh, peripheral nerve brachial plexus surgeon uh, with an NHS practice at the Royal National Orthopaedic and private practice at TLOC um, and paediatric practice at the Portland. I also have an academic uh, contract um, with the Centre for Nerve Engineering uh, in UCL. But nerves is all I do. Um, and Sorry, that was our uh, last slide. So we'll come to talk about the end uh, of next week. But to get back to where we are today, the, the definition of pain is that there is this sensory and emotional component of actual or potential tissue damage. And that allows us to determine, as Dean has said, between nociceptive, actual tissue damage, or the thought that the neuronal system is detecting potential tissue damage. And so nociceptive pain arises when a normal system detects damage. This neuropathic pain is an abnormally functioning uh, pain detection system. Um, but neuropathic pain itself is not a true diagnosis. It is a set of symptoms. But it is often severe. As we've said, it can be recalcitrant to treatment. It has the ability more frequently than nociceptive pain to become chronic and therefore has a greater impact on psychology and function um, and psychologic pathology um, interaction. So this is a really important concept that neuropathic pain functions as a symptom and isn't a disease entity in itself. It's a common pathway of expression of a number of different steps. And as Dean has mentioned, there's a variety of medical neuropathies that occur because of systemic damage to nerves. Now, I'm not gonna to touch on those today, but for example, diabetic neuropathy means that that nerve is more likely to be affected by standard conditions of nerves, such as compressive neuropathies. And so there is a significant body of, of evidence that shows that decompressing these pathologic nerves does help with their symptoms. I'm not gonna to touch on that today, I'm gonna to specifically deal with post-traumatic neuropathic pain. And so care must be determined in your history to determine the cause. So where did it come from? Because if we don't understand its genesis, we're gonna to struggle to get a diagnosis and struggle therefore to go on to relieve those symptoms. And all of this without a doubt cannot be done as our surgeons have traditionally done in isolation, surgery with no other input. All of these things are, it's a bit like that British uh, cycling concept of those small incremental gains. This is a very difficult area and therefore everything has to be going your way. So there has to be psychologic support, specifically for those patients where there is thought to be a surgical cure, in inverted commas, to sell the patient the snake oil that it's definitely going to be better, for them then to have an outcome that is poor 
and then to drop that patient without any help and support is torture for them. And so an appreciation that in surgery, most of what we do has a very high number needed to treat in a hip replacement or in cancer, number needed to treat would be around one. So many of the drugs that Dr. Hoff Penny prescribes, an NNT of three, four, six is perfectly normal. For surgeons, that's a strange concept that you'd operate on six people and only make one better. But in neuropathic pain, an NNT of around three is quite common. Number needed to harm, hopefully, is one in a few hundred. But the number needed to treat is, is one in three. Therefore, two out of three patients that I select to be likely to benefit are not going to. So we're going to talk about those traumatic pains. And the key concept that I have here is that neuropathic pain can be both evoked or spontaneous, meaning that it's either there naturally, so it's there when they're sat still, it's there when they're doing nothing, or it's there when the patient is stimulated, touched or stimulated emotionally or whatever else. And they're really important concepts and part of the examination and history, because as Dean said, a nerve can be completely transected and the distal territory completely numb, but the hand can feel like it's being hit by a blowtorch. Even though if you actually put a blowtorch on the hand, the hand wouldn't notice that, the spontaneous symptom can have se severe um, uh, expressed problems, and there may be no evoked symptoms. So that tells us that the nerve is not intact. Whereas if those symptoms that are evoked, it means the nerve is intact, is functioning, but is abnormally detecting from the skin and almost every adult nerve injury comes with neuropathic pain so damage a nerve and you're likely to have pain and that pain has all those psychological impacts that we've spoken about but tissue damage itself causes pain this isn't the medical neuropathy but direct damage of nerve through the processes of pressure causing local change to um, circulation causing hypoxia Strain focus. So if I take a meter long nerve and stretch it by a centimeter, that's a 1% strain across the whole nerve that can easily be coped with. But if I take one meter nerve and it's kinked or held in the middle, that one centimeter stretch will be felt by that one centimeter segment that's tethered, which is 100% strain, which will damage the nerve. Cytokines and local tissue uh, release, for example, from skin that just flo floods out nerve growth factor can stimulate damaged nerves. Uh, we've got strain focus again as a repetition and then we'll move on and talk about what happens when you cut nerves as a neuroma or as Dean has mentioned pull them from the spinal cord and we'll deal with that first. Here is a an operative picture of somebody's neck. At the top will be the head, the arms coming out towards us and the chest is on the left. What you can see here on that swab are the five cervical roots, the, the um, ventral and dorsal roots and you can see there's the um, spinal nerve but here is the dorsal root and a dorsal root ganglion there so that has been pulled directly from the, from the spinal cord this is a brand new avulsion only a few hours after the injury that the next day so Wallerian degeneration hasn't occurred so the ventral root is still working but we're just showing that when you stimulate the dorsal roots which are the sensory input nothing happens because they are the the afferent nerve fibers. So there is an avulsion injury. And with that comes damage to the spinal cord and with that comes a severe pain. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, but the fact that this is a pathology that can create severe pain, it's essentially a spinal cord injury is an important diagnosis to bear in mind. I'm gonna to focus today on these four diagnoses which are surgically amenable causes of neuropathic pain. One called neurostenalgia, post-traumatic neuritis, symptomatic post-traumatic neuroma or neuromata as the plural or causalgia and the key thing here is history and examination the mechanism of injury like all trauma were you hit by a small toddler on a push bike or was it a motorbike at 100 miles an hour were you hit with a piece of rubber piping or a knife all of these things are really key to the energy and the mechanism of energy uh, transference is the nerve in function intact so is this other evoked symptoms and the special sign of a tenel sign so if we tap along the course of the nerve and we hit a neuroma that will cause tingling in the distal territory of the nerve so these are all specific features of a pain history that i will elicit from a surgical point of view 
amputations. Every time an amputation is undertaken, this will create neuromata. So we're cutting the nerve. It's got nowhere to grow to because the rest of the limb, unfortunately, has gone in the bin. So those nerves will form neuroma. Whatever you do, it's the natural and healthy response of a nerve to form a neuroma. This is a post-traumatic neuroma. It's been cut by a knife. Is it symptomatic, though? Many new neuromata are, and that means that they are producing symptoms either within the stump itself or within the phantom that is left. So if we have an arm that's been amputated and we stimulate the median neuroma, the patient will feel symptoms into the phantom limb because the brain will be telling some signs are coming up that median nerve. It must be coming from the hand. And that can be due to a variety of causes. Here is a neuroma that I have cut free next to a 50 mil syringe so you can get an idea of the size. These terminal neuroma cause pain either by the fact that there's scarring within that neuroma that's stimulating those nerves that creates spontaneous pain or evoked symptoms when it's squashed or pushed. So you can have a stump that's perfectly fine until you try and weight bear on it. That creates a, a, an evoked problem for the nerve, which creates pain. What can we do with these? Well, whatever we do to the nerve is going to form another neuroma. And so we can try and grow those nerves somebody, somewhere else. If there's no spontaneous symptoms, there's no scarring within that neuroma, moving it from an area where it can be mechanically or chemically stimulated is the way to treat it. So we'll remove it from its location and place it deeper normally into muscle. If there's spontaneous pain, there's scarring within that neuroma, as there was in this case, I'll resect the nerve to hope that we regrow a happier neuroma in a more suitable position. And then there's this concept, surgical technique of targeted muscle reinnovation, TMR. And that's a concept whereby instead of leaving the nerve to grow a little mushroom neuroma like that, we can tell the nerve to try and grow into muscle, physically take those axons and grow them into muscle rather than leave them just to create a stump. Here's a neuroma in continuity. This is, this is uh, one of the slides within our, our unit from our previous uh, consultants. This was from 1936 um, and shows damage to a median nerve where it was partially cut and it's formed a neuroma in continuity. The nerve is still working, but there's that swollen area within it creating problems. Targeted muscle reinnovation is taking those nerves and growing them into muscle. The idea and some of the early data is showing that this reduces neuroma formation and reduces pain. But the slightly more exciting side of things is that we may well then be able to use those signals from the median and the ulnar nerve from an amputated arm, grow those into the pectoralis muscle, and then the brain can think open and close and play the piano. And that will be written large in electrical signals across the chest, as you can see on the heat map. And we can transduce those to control a myelectric prosthesis. So we're very excited about the future for this for two reasons, the pain control that it probably seems to be giving its early days as yet, and it's hard to compare um, uh, treatments, but also that it's got this other uh, function. Neurostonalgia, to move on, stenos is the Greek to crush or to moan, and this is where nerves get gathered by scar tissue and squeezed. It causes hypoxia, it causes strain, as we've mentioned, strain focus. Um, and it causes a nerve in continuity to have allodynia. So light touch interpreted as pain. This is the most rewarding nerve condition to treat. This has a very high rate of success. If I take that scar tissue away, we can restore microcirculation to the nerve. We can allow the pressure to get above that venual pressure. You see the veins fill, that um, uh, potassium and uh, um, um, uh, sodium ions and um, uh, acidity can be washed away and the nerve can start to function again. Here is, that was a video, but here is a, um, a picture of a neurolysis being under, undertaken. Now, I'm afraid that doesn't seem to run as a video, but we dissect the nerve free of um, the scar tissue, and you can see those veins, I'm sorry that's not live, sh um, showing the benefit of that surgical treatment. We have quite a deal of data that this is a, a very useful procedure. We have uh, pre and post pain scores here showing significant drop after neurolysis. This is in infraclavicular brachial plexus injuries. And we also know the sooner we get to this, 
the better. So if we leave it to become chronic, it's less likely, as in most pain states, to be treatable. Uh, note, we're not curing pain here. We are reducing. And I think it's a significant change if we take a pain score or an aspect of a pain score and reduce its severity or its frequency by half. Post-traumatic neuritis, I put the same nerve picture up because it's often linked. Um, Post-traumatic neuritis is often where energy has been dumped into the nerve and it swells. So that starts to create symptoms immediately if you fall and hit your, um, your elbow and you get shooting pain down, that is a post-traumatic neuritis, a percussive neuritis, and that can create a persistence of that pain due to swelling. So once again, this is about a decompression. So it's taking a nerve that's upset and making its physical environment a lot more um, sustainable and uh, sympathetic. And again, this would be decompressing nerve tissue. Causalgia we see rather infrequently, thankfully, this is this super severe, what we everyone would recognize as a horrible CRPS type um, picture with a, um, a, a dystonic limb with sympathetic dysfunction. The patient hides it away. They don't even want the air moving around it. Loud noises will trigger the pain. And this is a high energy in injury to nerve and the soft tissues around and often the vessel. And this requires transection of that um, uh, area because it isn't functioning and grafting and often repair of the arterial injury as well but this is a very high energy um, injury to all of the tissues around the nerve and is very hard to treat but again very rewarding because even just transecting that nerve will uh, make a great deal of difference to that patient. Then after all of these, we generally want the nerve to then, after I've played around with it, not to persist with upset and um, pain. And so after all of these procedures, we're likely to exacerbate pain in the short term. And so I will place an infusion catheter proximal to the work that's been done surgically and place a, an infusion of local anesthetic around that nerve to block the symptoms and the signs from the surgical work and so as not to exacerbate the pain state. You'd hope that the surgical intervention has improved the condition, but short term, uh, it's about blocking that pain. And often percutaneous uh, catheters can be placed, but with surgery, we can make sure the nerve is free of scar tissue, lie that catheter right next to the nerve, and that can often be useful for a, um, a indwelling long-term catheter, which can have therapeutic benefits as well. Just a brief mention of a variety of other neuropathic pain states, such as a thoracic outlet, complicated and would talk in itself, but there are a number of uh, conditions that are teetering on the edge of compression and perhaps are triggered by a fall or a car crash or a whiplash type injury and can create a neuropathic pain state de novo, which was um, pre-existingly um, vulnerable due to anatomic variations. Here we can see a cervical rib worse on the right than the left. I have a blank slide as my last slide for electrodiagnosis because really this does not play a part. Nerve tests, neurophysiology, uh, nerve conduction, EMG can all be normal. And so it is not a test to diagnose neuropathic pain. We often use it for nuance, but in terms of seeing some nerve uh, tests and then coming back normal, that is not an exclusion of neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain mainly affects the small unmyelinated fibers and they are not interrogated by most neurophysiologic tests. So it can be barn door completely normal and that patient can still have a diagnosis of neuropathic pain. So please don't make that mistake. So the key message, remember to look for that diagnosis. Think about nerve pain after trauma. Think about the mechanism, Tinel sign, and talk to your local nerve surgeon for any help and advice. Um, and I just wanted to go back before we finish, because I was going to put the slide as the last one, to uh, mention our next week's um, uh, T-Lock talk is on hand uh, problems. It's a very handy talk. Um, we'll be on the same time next week. Uh, Eventbrite again, please register online. Any questions? You can type in the chat if you don't want to put your hand up or please just uh, unmute yourself and throw any questions at uh, Dean or myself. There must be some burning question of allodynia or dysthesia. 
maybe everyone's falling asleep. Uh, Tom, can I ask a question really about uh, primarily avulsion injuries? Um, the, 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 the picture of the um, uh, brachial plexus you showed all the cervical roots. Um, the repairs look like they're fairly complex. Um, what, what, what typically happens to nerves after an avulsion? Do they shrink away and are they, are they easy to reconnect? So with an avulsion injury, it's very rare that I will, it's, it is possible to reconnect. And if someone has a five root avulsion, so no usable nerves within in the arm, then we can do what's called spinal cord reimplantation. And that is good for restoring continuity from brain to nerve. And that, when it restores function, tends to dampen mus um, pain down. If there's an avulsion of just two or three roots, then I won't try and repair those. I, I certainly can't do anything more to the spinal cord injury. It's that gliosis scar that tends to create the pain. Um, and all I'm going to do is put a knife in the spinal cord to poke a nerve in, and that's likely to create more gliosis stimulation. So the way to treat avulsion injuries for the patient's function is to use the other nerves and rewire distally. So take nerves that are passing by the shoulder or the elbow and wire those in. And we've seen through um, anecdote, but also um, significant data, both in the real world and when you place people into virtual reality, that providing visual input and uh, motor input, so seeing a moving arm and feeling a moving arm dampens down pain. That, that cortical uh, assessment, as you say, that's getting no information in from the limb, it doesn't see it moving. It just presumes it's squeezed in red hot magma. And so when we aim to restore movement, it isn't often just to restore the movement. It's the acceptance that the major concern of the patient's going to be the pain and restoring even some small movement, even, even to get some natural swing of the arm during gait is really helpful. Very, very interesting. And do, will you invariably develop neuromas at any transected end? So any nerve that's still connected to its cell body will create a neuroma. So um, any nerve that is cut will create a neuroma unless there's a damage further up so that the cell body producing the protein to pass down the axon can't create a nerve. So in the double crush or the double laceration injuries, it's going to be that proximal stump that creates the neuroma. Um, and it's just a natural ability of that nerve. All all axons want to try and regrow, but in the brain and spinal cord, the glial cells, the oligodendrocytes and the astrocytes stop that by scarring. It's the Schwann cells within the uh, peripheral nerve that give us the ability to regrow these nerves and direct them. So I take Schwann cells and try and use those to direct nerves to grow to different places. And the best way to restore, um, um, to reduce pain is restore function. So not only motor function, but the sensory function. So to try and reconnect nerve, the key experience that I mentioned of nerve injury is pain and getting nerves repaired after trauma is the best way to try and, well, and then rehabilitated is the best way to treat pain. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, I think we, we, we underestimate the nociplastic ability of the brain to, 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 to actually it will never revert to what it was, but you can make it a whole lot better with with committed ongoing therapy. Uh, and that really does need to, you know, that those sorts of therapies need to carry on for years, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. And that's and that's how close working relationships such as we have and our um, psychology and physical and occupational therapists, play therapists in kids. All of those things have to mesh and we've got to talk and we've all got to be on the same message because there's nothing worse than mixed messages on likely recovery time or likely final outcome. There's got to be a united message that everyone is uncertain about the future, but has a clear uh, range within which we're expecting time of recovery and quantity of recovery. Great. Anyone out there got questions? Um, you've got a few minutes left before we wrap up. I think maybe it's just you and me, Tom. I think it is just a nice chat on a <laughs> Thursday afternoon. <laughs> but I think I think all of us would say that there is there is significant benefit to 
people having access to specialist centres for neuropathic pain. Um, and I, th I think any of those concerns and questions that you have, um, you know, please, please send us a message um, and we can always advise and review those patients. Um, I've got something I've just seen in, in, in the chat box. It says, hi, radiculopathy pain, does it help surgery? Thank you. Um, Kieran, I'm not not 100% sure if you mean does surgery help with radiculopathy pain and I, 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 I'm going to assume that that's what your question is. Um, well certainly where there is evidence of, of, of compression be it through disc or scarring or anything else then 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 definitely decompressing um, is, is, is the right way forward and I'm sure Tom would agree with that because Obviously, the longer you, 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 you leave a nerve to a prolonged inflammatory event or compressive event, you do start to develop these chronic changes and you will get less, less spontaneous nerve neural recovery. So, again, it's very, very crucial to, to, again, as Tom says, neuropathic pain is not a diagnosis. You have to keep looking. They may present with neuropathic pain, but you have to keep saying, what is the mechanism? What's the cause? What's underpinning this? Why has this happened? Uh, and so, yeah. There we are. Surgery can certainly help a radiculopathic pain where you can see the actual cause of compression. Um, I completely agree, Dean. I think I think the key thing is to recognise that there is a significant chemical event, and what we see as compression often on 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 scans won't necessarily change between symptomatic time and an asymptomatic or, or recovered time or entirely uh, pre problem so it's not necessarily that we're treating scans we're treating um the whole the whole patient and again chronicity really Im important and making sure we've dealt with the inflammatory and the pain driving aspects as well as the uh, perceived um uh, compression um i've just put my twitter up on there because i think we're going to start running out of time um so if you've got any questions please uh, find me there um question on if avulsion injury is old and pain is long set any benefit in considering surgery um so certainly avulsion pain is very recalcitrant to treatment um it has to be treated um early it has to be treated well and as i say with a, a sort of combined team um uh, psychologic support recognizing that this is likely to be chronic and getting patients to adapt and accept um that that pain and not hope for cure hope for reduction um in those symptoms so i think it's i, I think generally chronicity with uh, spinal cord injury pain avulsion pain is a significant challenge um spinal cord stimulators can help but I don't think really in a chronic situation, because um, we've often moved beyond the point to reanimate a limb then. So I do think um, virtual reality may well be a help. We've certainly seen with our research at UCL significant um, efficacy there, but probably not uh, peripheral nerve surgery chronically. Brilliant, excellent. Well, it's now 27 minutes past. Um, we've had a few thanks via the chat box, which is um, very grateful for you having tuned in. Uh, and I'm, I hope you, you appreciate it. I certainly enjoyed my, my, my talk. I enjoyed learning from Tom. I enjoyed the chat. So uh, we should do this again. I think it works well. It's been a real pleasure. Thank all you. Right. You take care. Thanks. Nice to see you all. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.